Welcome to another edition of Overcome Out Loud with Charlie Smith. On this podcast, uh, we get a chance to sit down with real people that have overcome real challenges in their lives to give others hope. Too many people suffer in silence, and this has been a movement to help people understand um, that there are things they can do to overcome the challenges in their lives. And I'm really, uh, I've been very much looking forward to having our friend from across the ocean on, Dr. Ruth Mary. Alan is with us. Hello, how are you? Good evening there in the UK. Hello, Charlie. I'm really well, thank you. From over the pond. Yes, over the pond. I'm so glad. Dr. Ruth Mary Allen is a PhD from the University of Cambridge. She holds uh, also a uh, position as a brain health practitioner for many, many years. She's the host of the popular podcast on Winject Studio, Unchaining Your Pain, which I had a, the pleasure of being on one of the most compassionate, empathetic women um, and professionals that I've had a chance of speaking with. And, and she's a bit of a dual threat on Overcome Out Loud. So, you know, as I've gone on this mission, we've had both subject matter experts on and then also people that have had incredible overcome stories. And, and uh, Dr. Ruth Mary Allen has both. And so I'm really excited for you all to, to hear from her, her vulnerability, her courage, and also uh, to learn what she's doing now to help others that have been in pain to, to unchain uh, their brain and use the skills that she's learned and teaches to so many and, and her wisdom is remarkable. So, I mean, that's, it's, it's a privilege and an honor to have you on and I just can't thank you enough. Oh, Charlie, thank you so much for inviting me. It's a real pleasure to be on your show and, and to be able to share my story and, um, and also to hopefully give some insights to people and hope this will be an opportunity for people rather than a threat to to help them see that there is light at the end of what can often feel like a very dark and long tunnel um irrespective of what your struggle may, may be and i'm really um happy to, to share my story in full so I'm excited to be here thank you for having me yeah i think you know i'm in the hope business and and i i i, I differ from kind of that toxic positivity where you know we want to we want to walk around with with kind of bright merry sunshine faces when things are tough and and really things do get tough but but i think your message and the message that we give here is is that there's hope and that despite one door closing yeah. another another can open and that we do have the power um within ourselves to actually help ourselves and, and often it comes from getting insight from other people and so can you tell, um, can tell us a little bit about your origin story and, and a little bit about what growing up in, in your skin was like? So I, um, I'm a, from a family of, of three siblings. Um, my dad was a successful um, a certified a chartered electrical engineer. And I worked really hard as a kid. Um, that was my forte. It was also my go-to escape mechanism. Um, and I was very successful through education. Um, although it looked successful on the outside, it often didn't feel it on the inside. And, um, and I worked through my university degrees, not really knowing what I wanted to do, ended up starting my own business and really came to a stage in my life where I, I spent my time being an entrepreneur and I wanted to understand what it was like working in the corporate world so I went and joined one of the big four in the city um, to understand what it was like actually having a, a boss and not being my own boss and I was really set on starting a family I was really set on getting to that next level in life I'd, I'd been um, pro, a performance manager for massive multi million dollar contracts and I thought I was going to step into the sort of billion dollar space for the firm that I was joining and it was completely not that case at all I, I felt like I went backwards 10 years so I really sort of hit a, a point in my life where I just wondered whether I'd made the right decision but I persevered because I wanted to start a family and I thought I was on track to get promotion to senior manager worked really hard throughout the year in the corporate world, gave up my time with, with my husband, gave up career opportunity, uh, course opportunities, personal development opportunities to really push towards um, this promotion I was seeking. 
And I got to the end of my performance year in the in the corporate world. And just as I was coming to the end of it, I, I fell pregnant and I was so excited uh, about that. But I had no idea um, what was to follow. And um, within seven weeks, um, I had a really traumatic miscarriage and um, was straight after that um, told by the firm that I um, had not performed um, in the year. I, despite reaching my performance targets and smashing them that the firm had set, um, they, they came up with a very soft target that I was unaware of and they told me I had no emotional intelligence. And that really hit me uh, straight in the heart, really, because I felt like a biological failure because I had this miscarriage and hadn't been successful in in creating the the, the baby and creating the family that I'd really hoped for. And, and straight after that, they told me I was an emotional failure. And so it put me on a very quick, rapid downward spiral um, uh, into a chronic stress, depression, and subsequently ended up having suicidal thoughts. And that was the point that I um, realised I needed to take um, rapid action to pull myself out of the hole that I was in. And it was a it was a action that I didn't realise I could take personally because I sought help from the firm, and because of my position in the firm, they said um, that I was not the right grade uh, to offer often the coaching that I sought out so I so I got for it personally and it was it that was the route out for me is to look forward rather than look back um, and to find a way out uh, and through that tunnel so I, I ended up with an emotional intelligence coach uh, through the high performance institute and I worked through a program un- understanding that it wasn't just me that was at the fault here but it was the surroundings that I was in that were very incredibly toxic at the time. Um, and my lifestyle habits that I developed as part of pushing myself into uh, getting this promotion and the chronic stress that I'd subsequently put on myself, not just in terms of the promotion itself, but also um, subsequently the, the stress of the miscarriage and the grief that, that follows from having a miscarriage irrespective of of how um, short or long term you're in the pregnancy it's traumatic for you um, it's traumatic and and um, and I worked through that period to, had to take time off of work um, because of the stress that I I was experiencing as part of the performance review because there was that I couldn't talk about the miscarriage because it was too painful to talk about so I put all of my energy into the work situation and trying to prove that I had emotional intelligence and none of my energy into looking after myself. And what ended up happening, as I'm sure so many people are familiar with, is you end up reaching for the self-help solutions, which for me was alcohol um, and also uh, copious quantities of coffee in the afternoon just to get through the day uh, and chocolate cake. And I put on loads of weight. I became uh, dependent upon the alcohol in the evening to get to get through the the evening, and it got to a point where I, you know, I just couldn't get up in the morning. Uh, I was constantly crying all the time. Um, getting out of bed was a real struggle, um, and I had had no passion, no no purpose, and I and I felt a real failure, um, and it was a really really difficult difficult time for me to wow. get through yeah oh i can i can imagine i mean there's 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 so much to that history um you know as we start as we start to uh, to, to kind of unpack this a little bit together and, and go back i mean you said something i think very early on that struck mm-hmm. me is something that i think a lot of people that end up where you end up um face which is this kind of whether I'll call it imposter syndrome or this, our insides not matching our outside. I mean, you had this drive, you know, it sounds like this, this success drive. If I get the job, if I get the degree, if I get these things, then then it'll (laughs) demonstrate my worth. So were you, was, were you, was that something that was upon you from a young age? Were you seeking to differentiate? Where did the drive 
for this kind of, you know, and, and, and again, not feel you, you said, you, you, you know, from an exterior standpoint, you were achieving and getting degrees, but on the inside, you, you felt different than the way that the external image of you was being portrayed. And I, and I think, as I said, I think that's very common. Can you um, help us understand what you've learned about that? Maybe where it came from, because I don't, yeah, think it, so I don't think it's uncommon. No, it's not. And, and, you know, when you get a degree, um, getting a degree is the end state of what is often a tremendous amount of hard work same as get becoming promoted to you know ceo of a business is is a is a marker in the sand but it doesn't it doesn't tell you <laughs> what's happened in the process so i was always academic from i really just enjoyed mathematics from a very young age i i, I honestly don't know what the fire for that was my dad was an engineer um, my brother's a mechanical engineer. My sister's very good. Um, she's a um, she's very good with finances. I just happen to to be that in between, um, you know, enjoying the physics. And I ended up doing physics for my for my degree in German as as my first degree. But just to get to university, I I, I was very academic. And, and I didn't do so well with my A-levels. I, I didn't perform at my best. I was distracted um, by boys uh, uh, as a teenager and, <laughs> or, or adults, as it was. And, um, and that really depreciated my grades. But fortunately, I got, got enough to get into um, Imperial College. But when I was in Imperial College, um, uh, one of my tutors at the time um, said to me I don't think you um I don't think you've got the intelligence to to go on and do further education have you thought about joining the army um and going in as, as a regular and I was like wow that I mean this is no you know I have a great relationship with Imperial but I was like goodness that that's not me for six for somebody I was only in my second year at university and I've I wasn't doing very well, so it was, a, it was a reasonable statement for them to make. But I was like, wow, I have to prove to him and to, to myself that I'm better than that statement that he's just given me. And so I worked really hard. And at, at the end of my first degree, I, I got a 2-1. Um, and, then, and then the next stage of that was I wanted to go and do further education, didn't know whether I was going to go into industry, went to see careers advisor and again I got told I was interested in medicine don't think you're intelligent enough to go and do medicine you should go and become a salesperson and I was like wow <laughs> there's another hit um so I thought well, I'm going to prove you wrong and and prove to myself I am so I went and did an MSc in in semiconductor science and technology and then again on the next transition to get to Cambridge again didn't feel intelligent enough to to go into Cambridge um, and there's a common theme here. So you can see this sort of intelligent thread is, was very important to me. And we all have an ego and mine was big. Um, and each of those knocks would, would knock me back. Um, and so I went to Cambridge and, and uh, ended up getting a PhD and, and recognised as a role model in the States and in, in, um, by an organisation in the States and also recognised um, by the UK government as a role model in information technology electronics and communication um, and that was all through proving <laughs> to myself and, and to others that I was better than the than the comments that they that they gave to me um, had, and that, that, that I was intelligent <laughs> which, which so, had more which had more influence over you so I you, you pointed out this common theme and and so you're constantly being told from a very young age as you get into these different stages that you're not enough you know and, and I think this yeah. is some thing that I want to really emphasize because I think there's so much. And, and when I look at the amount of people that are on medication today, when I look at the, the loneliness epidemic, and this is long before COVID, by the way, I mean, this is, yeah. you know, we're, we're talking about, you know, four years ago, they were predicting how many people would be depressed or anxious and, and that it would reach the height of being the number one disability in the world uh, would be, mm. would be these things. And so you're, you're being told, you're actually being told you're not enough. Your teachers are telling you you're not enough consistently. And so mm -hmm. you wanted to prove that you were enough by achieving. But I'm wondering, you know, when you talk about your insides, 
you, were you hearing that message? Did you believe you, did you believe you were enough or were you believing them and thought that your achievements could prove them wrong? Um, I think I was believing them yeah. uh, to a certain degree. And if I achieved, then I'd proven them wrong. Um, and then I could prove to myself that I was, I was enough. Um, yeah, I think but this but is... the outcome was the proof, not my internal dialogue. Yeah, that's yeah. you know Max, so Max, Maxwell Maltz. That's a big that, difference. Yeah, <laughs> ma- and this is so amazing because in in, in psycho cybernetics and Maxwell Maltz book, he talks about how we we will become the person we conceive ourselves to be, and that internal thermostat is the ultimate driver. And so, yes, you can achieve, you can get degrees, you can have mon- monetary success, you can have the external trappings, but if the internal dial is set to not enough ultimately you will end up in dependency depression. I mean, that the, the symptoms that ultimately yeah. took over was the result of you chasing an external thing to, to kind of numb the internal, not enough. And, and I think um, maybe, you, you know, given your capacity today, you can obviously speak to that. So, so clearly, but that's, that's, I faced, you know, as you, we broke down my story, I faced that, mm. you know, that, that, that internal belief that I wasn't enough and trying to prove it with success or, or, or material things. And ultimately, Ultimately, you know what I always say: what you don't deal with is going to deal with you. And ultimately, yeah. that 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 sense of self worth ultimately got reinforced, and you believed it, and and you went to some pretty dark places. Yeah, and I think I was chronically stressed for a very long period of my life beyond the the firm experience because I hadn't I hadn't had the training, the coaching to understand what my internal dialogue was, what was going on inside of me. And how the surroundings um, that I was in would massively influence my behavior. And we we talk a lot, you know, from a mental health perspective, um, it is we very much become the label and we very much become the the origin uh, of, you know, the root cause of the issue. But but your surroundings, your environment play a huge impact in how your brain is is developed and how it evolves. And you know, if you're constantly seeing threats, then your your brain will respond to that threat, um, and that you'll reinforce that those uh, connections in your brain um, to 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 make sure that you survive. That's what we're here. Is that you know, it's a survival mechanism. If you if you exposed to stuff all the time, then then you you you'll start to believe it. Um, and so once I learned. Um, that the only person's opinion that matters as to whether you can or can't do something is your own. <laughs> it doesn't matter about anybody else's and you can turn down that volume of negativity and learn how to turn down the volume of negativity, both from the outside and also importantly from the inside. Um, then, then you can step into that person that you want to be, but it's having, it's understanding what those tools are and understanding what's actually going on in your mind is so important what 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 you're telling yourself what records you're playing in your mind what what software you've developed understanding whether the software that you know the the program that's running in the background that maybe perhaps you don't pay any attention to like we have running on our computers whether that program is making your your computer your brain go slower or whether it's making it go faster whether it's helping it or whether it's hurting it and unfortunately, um, we don't get taught this. We don't, you know, it's not it's not a skill that we get taught at, at school. It's not a skill that we get taught at university. It's it's not often a skill we get taught in business until you're very high up in the business ladder. Often um, to understand that inter- uh, internal dialogue. And I know we have neurodiversity, which is a, a completely different topic altogether. But it's understanding that you know how our brains operate and what what has molded and shaped our brain to get us to where we are today and unraveling the the programs that don't serve us anymore um which is which is so important is unchaining that pain that you've created in your mind that also 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 can often um express itself in your body um if we don't deal with trauma that's in our mind and making sure that we bring our bring those programs back to something that's serving us and and calm down any overactivity that isn't that isn't serving us as a person. So, yeah, you 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 bring up something which I think we should talk a little bit about here, which is this concept of you 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 described it I think 
pretty uh, pretty eloquently, which which I I call just expectancy theory, which is simply that mm -hmm. what we fo what we do focus on expands, you know, and that, yeah. and that and that was working, you know, against us for a long time when we believe you call them these these negative soundtracks that are playing, you know, and and people will will always, you know, be clear. I think we're taught how we're taught we're taught what to think, but we're really not taught how to think. And I've never heard, I mean, I'm 55 years old and it wasn't until recently that anybody ever described to me the fact that I could actually talk to myself instead of listen to myself and that I've been listening. And, 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 and in fact, to your point, I wasn't actually listening to myself. I was listening to a bunch of recorded messages that had been played by unqualified people, like an abusive father or a teacher mm -hmm. who diagnosed, but diagnosed me as learning disabled, or, or you were listening to these, to these, overlays that have been laid down by unqualified people that that influenced you and i think what people need to understand and and you've brought this right to the forefront early on in this podcast is that our influence over ourselves is 10 times more powerful than external influences but if we're but if our dial is at zero and all we're getting is negative then even though what other people think about us is only one tenth as powerful as what we think about us if all we're listening one tenth is still more powerful than zero and so if you're just mm -hmm. listening to those negative soundtracks and you haven't developed i'll call it your own advertising campaign i'm sure there's a, mm -hmm. a a much more scientific explanation for how we do view ourselves and create our own sense of self-worth but you know if all we're listening to is that negative influence those negative soundtracks that have been laid down we start to believe them. Correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah. To, and then we start to act on them as if they're true until we get to a, a point of like you did, you know, where, where, where the pain becomes almost unbearable. Can you, can yeah. you break some of that down? So, because the great news I think people need to understand is expectancy theory works the other way. When you start to see the good that is you, when you start to see the things that you do well, when you start to build that internal advertising campaign, you'll start to see all the things that you're doing well, and, and, and that can grow. And so it's really mm -hmm. about the seeds we plant in water that, that ultimately grow the plant. I mean, if you plant corn, you get corn. If you plant tomatoes, you get tomatoes. If you, if you listen to negative, you're going to get negative. And if you listen yeah. to something else, you can get something else. Yeah. Uh, so I think there's what I like to talk about. There's four quadrants to our well-being that we don't always pay that much attention to. Let's and break those emotion. down. Yeah, no, we'll, we'll talk about those. So the first one is our emotional well-being. How are what emotions we're having on a day-to-day -day basis, and what emotions we want to show up with, and they're two very different things. So the emotions that we have in in the moment, or, or the feelings that we're we're feeling, which is slightly different to emotions, generally tend to be longer term. Um, we rarely pay attention to, and this is this is like the cornerstone of emotional intelligence. Um, is understanding your emotions and how those emotions are affecting you cognitively, physically, behaviorally, um, and, and, and socially. Um, so it's really important that we take the time to work on our emotional well-being. And I'm not talking about emotional intelligence because I don't like that word intelligence because um, how some people perform, it, it is very different to others and it and it doesn't matter what emotions you have it's understanding what are present is the most important thing is to is to recognize that you've got emotions understand what the root cause of them is write them down so label them and 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 then um, professor mark brackett talks about this in his book permission to feel um he, he's got a great acronym called ruler to to remember them all um label them express them um uh, uh, and then make sure that you reflect on them and 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 do something about them because emotions are a signal to tell us that we need to take action it's okay to have a negative emotion <laughs> it's okay thank you, thank you. <laughs> to have a negative emotion anger is a good thing because it makes us want to take action emotions tell us to do something okay that's what an emotion is there for it's either telling us to go towards something or to go away from something, to, move, to, to go towards gain or away from pain. It's, it's a great signal that we, our bodies have to tell us to take action. But like a signal on the radio station, we often switch channels and we turn it off. We don't want to listen to the emotion, so we block it. But it's still playing. That radio station's still playing. And actually, 
when you switch channels and you ignore it, it gets louder because it wants you to listen to it. So what happens when you bury your emotions, which is what we often do with trauma, they become overwhelming because we bury them and bury them and then we can't deal with them because they amplify every time we bury them, the emotion shouts a bit louder. It gets to a point in our life where it has to shout to be heard. Um, and that shout, if it's not coming out of your mouth, comes out physically. Um, and um, anybody who's read Gabor Mate's work, is there's a very strong correlation between emotional trauma um, and the trauma we have with children and, and, and physical um, conditions that express themselves later in life. So it's really important that we take that time to connect with our emotions, irrespective of what they are. You know, I connect with my emotions every evening. I write them down and I get curious, not furious with them. And that's so important is we can get angry that we're having an emotion. That, does, that doesn't always serve us. It's about that emotional curiosity to understand what that root cause is and then start to unpick it uh, and learn what you can do about it. What, what is an appropriate action that you can take? That's the first quadrant. The, the second quadrant is your physical well-being. So this is our behaviours, our actions, what we do. That includes what we do for a job. So our physical well-being, including exercise and nutrition, all the things that we do, the actions that we take. And that's intrinsically linked to our emotions. So our emotions drive our actions. So if we are not um, aware of our emotions, then we're not necessarily in tune with why we're behaving the way we are. So it's really important that we recognise those they, they talk, both talk to each other. The third one is our mental well-being. And this, this is how we talk to ourselves, what thoughts we're having, what clarity of thought we have, what, what's playing on in the background in terms of self-talk um, and learning to tune in to the thoughts that serve you and to challenge, not tune out, but to challenge the thoughts that don't serve you. Um, and to take back control of those thoughts and not let them control you, which is often what can happen to us when we get to, into a downward spiral. We start, start telling ourselves and that record keeps playing and playing and playing. And we never take the time to go, hang on a minute. <laughs> I've got the power to take that needle off the record and stop it going round and round because the power yeah. resides within us. Thank, yeah, we want to... So we, we kick we kick the record player we 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 we, yeah, we, we turn the volume up and down play. but we don't but we don't take <laughs> and say wait a minute why don't i just take this record off and have but again this gets back to thought strategy if we if we don't know what you're teaching us and we don't know that we should develop some replacement thoughts and that we're going to need to go to those replacement thoughts because of our bias towards negativity and that our brain keeps score of our failures and mistakes to protect us you know i i, th I like what you said because i'm a firm believer that what got us here you know, from a primitive evolution of our brain standpoint yeah. is it's not going to get us there. You know, it served us to a point where we had to av avoid walking off cliffs or getting stepped on by dinosaurs, but, but there's no saber tooth tigers here in Westlake village. And I can assure yeah. you that what got me here isn't going to get me there. So yeah, changing that record uh, is so important. And, th and, and thank you for making people aware of that emotional quadrant um, and the connection mm -hmm. to all three of these. And then I know you'll take us to yeah. the rest of the, the matrix. Yeah. And then the yeah, and then the final one uh, of the quadrant of the well-being framework that I use is your spiritual well-being. So this is the connection to yourself, your core values and beliefs, your connection to your purpose and what you're passionate about, connection to others, the connection, connection to others, and your connection to a higher power. Now, for some people, that may be, uh, you know, your belief that you have in a God or it could be connection to nature or connection to something else that is, is bigger than you. Um, and it's important that we take the time to understand the internal connection that we have to ourselves and the external connection that, allow, that allows us to have with other people and also how we deeply connect with ourselves reflects on how connected we are to the things that light the fire inside of us um, and whether we're doing what we're passionate uh, about and that gives us purpose in life. So that's the spiritual well-being quadrant and it's quite extensive. It's, it's not often talked about. We often talk about three out of the four, 
but we don't always talk about all four of those and it's really important we do because they all talk to each other and that makes the whole of us and inside that circle is our biological um, construct that that got us into the into the world and they that will play out on all of those four quadrants depending on on how we are born um, and obviously we then shape it depending on the surroundings which sits outside the whole of us so it's really important we take that time to look at those four quadrants and look at how our surroundings influence all four of those and how our internal bio biological construct um, influences us too. Wow I, I mean that is a that's a, a pro priceless amount of information. I don't know. I mean, there's going to be a lot of re a lot of rewinding and going back for the next uh, eight minutes of this of this podcast, because I think there's there's a few things to talk about here. And the first I'll say is intentionality, which is really slowing the car down. Let's let's stay with this kind of signal concept, because I think it applies yeah. slowing the car down. And I think we're in a we're in a bit of a, a period where we hear a lot Oh, feelings aren't facts. And, and that may be true, but we're having them. And so like a signal light here in the States, we've got red yellow and green, uh, or yeah. green, yellow and red are, are, are that first quadrant is it's, it's telling us something and slowing the car down enough. Instead of just going through the red light, you go yeah. through the light enough, enough red lights, you're going to get in an accident. So slow, yeah, the, exactly. sl slow the car down and understand, uh, and be a little more intentional about, and I think you use the term curious and, and be fascinated instead of frustrated yeah. with these emotions. But I think we're all, you know, uh, you know, that dial turn, turn, let me just turn the dial off. anger, fear, sadness. For me, it was, you know, take a drink, do a line, take a pill. I want to, I want to get rid of that feeling versus what's a healthy reaction to anger. What's a healthy processing of sadness. You know, it's like, I don't have a, I don't have an anxiety problem. I have a grief problem. I'm, I'm, I'm yeah, exactly. and what I really need to do is grieve this loss where I have a disappointment yeah. problem. And, and if I pay attention to that emotion and then say, I mean, I think, as you said, write it down, get curious about it and then figure out what's yeah. a health, what's a healthy way to respond to this. Uh, it's, exactly. It really is slow, you, slowing the car down. Exactly. And, and if you don't check in with your emotion, as we all know, when we get road rage, we do something stupid. <laughs> you know, ro road rage is, is an emotion. Um, and so if we don't take that time to take control of the accelerator pedal and the steering wheel and, and slow down and use the brake and know where the brake is um, and know how to steer out of trouble, um, we're, we're going to be in a place where suddenly you, you, won't, some, <clears throat> you don't have your foot on the accelerator, your emotions do, and your emotions go and slam the accelerator on because you're not taking the time to listen to them. So they go, right, here we go. I'm going to take you on a ride and they're, and, and they're and connected. Got, you're com go ahead. And then, then you're completely out of control because your emotions are driving uh, the vehicle and you're not driving your emotions. Boy, the world needs a lot of Dr. Ruth Mary Allen. And I'll, I'll tell you <laughs> what you, when, when you drew that arc between our emotions and then our behaviors, right? Cause the next one of these behaviors that we engage yeah, in, exactly. I'll share, I'll share this experience with you. And I think, you, you, I think you'll find it interesting. So recently I got into a little bit of a, car accident I put my car into a guardrail on a on a on a side road as a result of not paying attention like I should have been and I was immediately uh -huh. I was immediately awash with guilt and shame for you know not paying attention like I should have and being distracted in a way that's not safe and I went to a car wash because the first thing I wanted to do was clean all of the ex, you know this experience I wanted to make it go away and as I was walking through the car wash the little mini mart I was like I'm gonna I'm going to get a Red Bull. Now I don't drink Red Bull. I'm a recovering alcoholic mm -hmm. and I don't drink Red Bull because I'm a recovering alcoholic. I don't drink Red Bull because I don't think it's good for me to get these huge yeah. caffeine spikes. Right. So I, yeah, I avoid, I, I avoid those things, but it was interesting to me in this moment of distress, you know, I'm thankful I didn't choose something either, either even more unhealthy, but I wanted something, you know, something yeah. that could help me escape the emotion of shame and guilt that I was feeling. And I, I stopped myself to your point. I took that moment of reflection and I said, you're disappointed in yourself. You made a mistake. You're not going to numb this out with Red Bull. You're going to feel this experience it, take care of your car and then decide. You know, so I got a bottle of water and it was, it's those moments that we have 
of reflection that can really, in, 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 you know, I use it as a, as a simple example, but I noticed how quickly I wanted something unhealthy to numb the feeling of guilt and shame that I experienced. And I think mm -hmm. when you drew that arc between the emotional connection and our behaviors, it really, that, that experience struck me. And I've, and I've also, by the way, you know, before I got sober, I've had a lot of, a lot more unhealthy reactions to emotional dysregulation. It was always pick up a drink or a drug, or as you said, mm -hmm. the, 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 the food at night or the alcohol at night. And so there is a strong connection between those two. And so how I, I was able to do that by pausing, what is the, what is mm -hmm. the, what is the method or the skill that you've helped people develop to find that kind of space between stimulus and response, I guess, yeah. for lack of a better term. So, so the one that I use, um, there's many, so we can do deep breathing, uh, we can do box breathing, we can just lie down on the, you know, just take the time to pause and lie down and just check in with ourselves, uh, just to notice ourselves, which is exactly what you did. One of my preferred approaches is havening, where we use the power of human touch to generate calming delta waves in our mind. And, and this, this approach actually helps um, to dissipate the uh, negative emotional charge that you that you have so you can do self-havening um, or you can do uh, go and see a, a certified practitioner like myself to, to use havening to reduce that uh, uh, tra trauma or the encoding that you have in your mind that relates to an unhelpful emotion normally tied back to a prior experience because all of our emotions are driven by our experiences in life so the, the more experiences we have the stronger the emotion tends to be around that bit, whatever that is that triggers it and um, so havening is one of my go-tos and, and you can sit you can do this in your car if you're having road rage um, simply as just rubbing your hands together um, you can do this yourself just rubbing your hands together for for a few just the palms of your hands the other one is to give yourself a hug that's the second approach all the way down through your arms and the third one is to is to wash your face if you're happy to um, and we we do this um, for our kids that for those that have children we find um, we need physical contact to emotionally regulate ourselves it's something that's inherent in us from birth um, it's necessary for human survival and it we're just tapping into what is is our own superpower that we have as humans to help regulate our emotions in a constructive rather than a destructive way and, and reduce that emotional charge. So we naturally do this as a parent, um, when we're good parents, <laughs> your, your child will want to hug. They're nurturing uh, as young children and the more hugs we get as kids, the more emotionally regulated we become and the more you know the greater our experience of emotional regulation and so the more we are able to deal with life's future emotional highs and lows because we've we've got that training um at, uh, built into our cognitive development um and so if you don't have it built in as a as a child or a, as a baby um you you can still use it still there we still possess this um, and if you're experiencing road rage as a classic, so um, I don't get road rage anymore, you used to have it a lot, um, you can just tape in your arm one, whilst, whilst you're driving if it's safe to do so, and it will naturally um, calm you down. And you can do that, you know, this is a, a technique that I'm, my daughter Lily learned when she was 18 months old, so it's incredibly powerful and she asks for it if she's if she's emotionally overwhelmed, she'll actually ask for havening um, now to help her regulate herself. Um, so it's, yes, it's incredibly powerful, developed by Dr. Ron Reed and Dr. Steve Rudin in the States. Um, but it's something that we should all, ideally, um, it's a tool that we can all learn um, and apply to day-to-day -day stress and anxiety. So that's, that's a good one. The other one, as I said, is to write your emotions down. Um, and to get curious, not furious with them. So, so go and understand what the root cause of that emotion is. Purely the act of writing it down takes the power out of it because you're now cognitively aware. You're bringing your um, internal brain activities that are going on 
to into your prefrontal cortex, your executive function of your brain. So you'll bring it to your conscious awareness or your unconscious activities. So that immediately dissipates the emotion, which is exactly what you did. You just pause and say, what's going on here? Um, and then challenge it. So challenge, you know, and not challenge the emotion, challenge any thoughts that sit behind the emotion that ties into your mental well-being. What, what is it you're telling yourself that could be creating the emotion that you're having or what in your environment has triggered you to have that emotion and where where is where has that come from and how can how can you take action like removing yourself from that environment so for me personally in my experience in the corporate world I knew that I was uh, when I went um, had to take time off I was I'm part of the military I had to go and teach people skiing for the for the for the army um, and I went away incredibly stressful, um, horrendous weather, difficult clientele, senior officers, um, and I was perfectly fine. There was no problem with me doing my job whatsoever in the slightest, and I was probably the coolest cucumber in the whole, on the whole trip, and yet actually the only instructor there and, and the most junior rank. But put me in the corporate environment that I was in, and I was a total mess because the environment that I was in wasn't serving me. And I think a lot of people are realizing this now with COVID and, and the changes in their work circumstances coming home, uh, working from home, not working in the office, is there's this, this shift and they realize that it either is or isn't, isn't serving them emotionally because it affects their emotions. Our environment massively influences our emotions and it's important that we take that into account. So it, it, there's, there's a lot here. And, and the next thing I wanted to ask you, and it's, it's curious to me. So um, we can be in lots of environments, but we have a lot more control than we think we do as it relates to how we respond or, 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 or choose to react to, to those environments. And so yeah. as you've developed, you know, so much um, significant development in, in your own personal approach to dealing with life, how would this woman deal with the work environment that she was in before or would she choose to leave that work environment because it didn't serve her is it, it could you have served could you have survived or would you have chosen that it didn't serve you and leave or would you have used the skills that you have now to make a difference in that environment i'm just curious what you would say what what this version yeah, of you I would, would say to that I, it was not uh, it was not something i could change so for me the phrase i use is uh, either change the environment or change the environment you're in and I couldn't change the environment. It was not a negotiable change to happen for it to serve me. The only way I could have changed was to move to a different part of the firm, but I still had that uh, label hanging over me that I didn't want to uh, be ridiculed with. Um, uh, and I, it, 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 you know, I was offered to, to move to a different part of the firm, but I just said, no, it's, this the culture was not for me um and uh, and you know and, and it was it was time to pull the eject cord and leave it to, and i would never have got pregnant with lily if i'd stayed there yeah um i would i would have been an emotional mess i would have been chronically stressed i might not have made you know i might have got through that time but when would be the next time that you would i would have been shamed right um and i didn't want that to be my you know, I didn't want that record to be playing or me to be nervous that that record was going to be put on the turntable and played uh, in front of me again, you know. So, you know, sometimes you have to just, you have to, you have to make that really, what often can feel like a really difficult decision, but um, an important decision to do what's right for you personally um, at, uh, and change the the status quo and take back control and that was for me was to, I had no control over that environment um it wasn't something I could influence I tried to influence it in in what I was doing there in the firm anyway and it was just it was just not not something that I could change it's like trying to turn an enormous oil tanker it takes a really long time um and I d I wasn't at the helm so so the best thing for me to do was was to move on and 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 forge my own path yeah, I think when I when I go back to your four quadrants and I think about guiding principles and, and values in our lives and, and as we become more intentional 
all about those, we start to have a little bit more of a compass about what we'll tolerate and not tolerate. And so mm. as, as then you didn't have guiding, guiding principles or values that you developed yourself, you were still listening to the narrative of not enough. And, and therefore, if I'm not enough, I'm mm -hmm. lucky to have this job. So what they say must be true. And I'm lucky to be, I mean, we tell ourselves mm -hmm. these stories to stay in these toxic environments mm -hmm. because we just don't feel worthy enough of making that change. But to your point, mm -hmm. when you get deep, when you do some deep work on those guiding values and principles about how we want to live, it, it sets a bit of a barometer as to what we'll accept. And so I think mm -hmm. this ver this version of you, you know, would have pulled the plug a lot, a lot sooner because the place didn't align with your values. And oh, principles. yeah. And we can all have those, right? Yeah, I would have definitely pulled it sooner. And, and actually, that was one of the key things I did. A, I had a business development coach that I um, hired initially, and we did a values assessment. And it was very clear that my values were not showing up in the firm. And that was one of the big aha moments for me that, you know, it didn't matter uh, what I did. The value of caring wasn't there. Um, and, and really, ironically, you know, being called out that I had no emotional intelligence, not once did anybody ask me how I was feeling. Which is the which is the cornerstone of it, you know. Not what and I, and I came up with the five pillars of brain health from my experience, which ties into the four quadrants I've just described. Which is to look at the facts, uh, feelings. The for F is for feelings. Your you know your brain is responsible for how you feel. Your actions, your connections to yourself and others, your thoughts and your surroundings. So they didn't look at any of those um, and how any of any of those were affecting me personally. And if they'd, that firm had taken the time um, to ask those five, you know, to explore those five pillars, um, starting with my feelings, um, it, you know, could it would have been a completely different conversation. Um, uh, and look, I would have felt what, understood. But, but look at what it's, I mean, I mean, the, the results of that pain, I think this is, you know, the other part of this, which is, mm. you know, look what it's, look, look what it, it's given birth to a movement. I mean, I, I, yeah. uh, I, 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 I predict what you're, do, what you're doing in this, in this episode and what you're doing, um, having been a part of, um, your, your podcast, I mean, your move, the world needs, as I said, and I'll say it again, the world needs what you're doing more than ever right now. And I'm, Thank I'm so you. grateful and I love, so it's, so go through the, 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 the facts again. It's, it's start, yeah. start us off. F is for feeling. A is for action. C is for connection. T is for thought. And S is for surroundings as the five, I call them the five pillars of brain health. And when you look at all of those, you're looking at all of those pillars of brain health. You can really make sure that you can learn how to show up as the best of you, but you have to do the deep work on each of them. Um, you can't ignore any of them. You can't ignore any. And there is that. And, and you, you know, I, I keep going back to what you resist persists. I mean, if, if you're listening to this and I tell you right now not to think about a pink elephant, I don't want you to think about a pink elephant. Please, if you're listening, don't think about a pink elephant. You're all <laughs> sitting there thinking about a pink elephant. And that's what happens. What, what we try to tell ourselves not to do, we, we end up doing. And this is really, I think, one of the greatest things about um, the evolution of emotional development and personal development is that we've got these new, you know, that, that we've got this idea of neuroplasticity, which is being used by so many that this path that you've been walking yeah. on is not the only path in the hiking trail and that you can start to pave a new path. I mean, the, the path you want to walk on may be covered with brush and there may be some thorns because you've never walked on it. But once you start clearing it, my God, I mean, it's, it, it takes you to the waterfall. It's, it's, yeah. but it is, as you said, it's that deep, it's the deep clearing. It's like figuring out where new path is and then getting the courage yeah. to start walking down it which is what I think yeah. you're giving everybody and, and often you know I'm a I'm a mountain leader uh, from a military perspective so often you don't think you're capable of walking that path you know as a, as a as a walker if you've got no experience of going up that hill or you know searching for a waterfall because you've nobody's taught you how to read the map or nobody's taught you what kit to wear you've not got the right boots um you need to ask for help you need to get a guide to help you get there because you, you're not, not going to get there by yourself as easily as you would do if somebody showed you the way because they've been there before. So it's really important, it, you know, if we're going on a journey of discovery and a journey of transformation, that we recognise the need to get support, to ask for help, because it's okay to ask for help. Um, what, what isn't okay is to, to slog it, you know, through and, and say, oh, there's no waterfall there because I can't get through the brush. Well, that's not true, is it? Because if you've got the right guy, 
you couldn't see the most beautiful scenery in the whole wide world and you might have been only only a stone's throw away from it but you just didn't have the right tools to cut effectively that brush to get there and you ran out of steam so it's really important you have the that right support mechanism you surround yourself with the right people to help you on that journey of discovery and uh, and life is a journey of discovery so and we're not me- we're not meant to go alone, are we? I mean, I think you, no. you bring up a, you bring up a point which I think every I will say in 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 all of our episodes in this podcast is now listened to internationally. We've had incredible guests on, um, like yourself, very very strong, very um, courageous mind thought leaders, and not one person has ever said. By the way, I really suggest you do this on your own. You struggle on your own. You find the solution <laughs> on your own. Everybody to a to a woman or man that has talked about what they've done to overcome. They've talked about the importance of asking for help. And, and so thank you for being another voice in, in the, in the importance of connect human connection and how we really are. We really are. And I think you said this earlier in your, in, in that, that spirituality quadrant, you know, that we're, we're designed to be together. We're designed to connect connect to connect to one another to to help our fellow woman or man up yeah you know when 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 it's too hard and and so um it's 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 incredible that you brought that up and i thank you for that because i i think no, no i think we've just been conditioned that you know that kind of pull yourself up by the bootstraps or you know fight through it and it's you know and i've always said you know can you get through it alone i don't know maybe you know will it take a long time probably is it much quicker, easier together? Absolutely. I mean, it's, it's for sure. It, it, we can sure go further together. Mm-hmm. And I think we kind of, it happens, doesn't it? At some point in our development, we go from a childlike state where we need help. And then somebody says to us, I'm sorry, you know, so, some switch happens and says, no, I don't need help anymore. But, you know, be a child. <laughs> Go back to being a child because we're a child in that new part of our life. Go back to being a child and going, okay, I, I, you know, I need to ask for help because that's what my daughter does. Mummy, I need some help, please. Can you help me with this? I'm, I'm struggling. Of course, we'll go and, and go and help, help her. And then she, she learns by doing and, and, and making mistakes. And, uh, but she knows she can't get there by herself. So. Uh, the cor- the courage is, is, is incredible. The vulnerability is incredible. And, you know, I think I'll ask you the question that I like to ask most people that, that have been through what you've been through, which is, you know, when you got to that point, so that, that, that point of the, the alcohol dependence at night, the depression of not being able to get up in the morning and, and, and you, you, you decided to, to, to take a different approach. What, what is the, the kind of simple, I like to make the start easy for people. What are, what are the really simple things people can do, you know, when they're at that, cause I, you know, I, there's a lot of people that are at that point where, where that's that dark cloud is, is looming. What are the, what are the small, simple steps? What are the, the suggestions? What's your toolbox look like mm. to help people kind of make those small incremental steps to, to start walking slowly out of that spot as you did? So I think for me, just to reflecting on my journey, I, the first thing I did was ask for help. So that was the first thing. Um, and recognizing I wasn't going to be able to do this alone. Um, you know, suicide is in my family. My my mum, um, dad committed suicide, so it was something that was very much at the forefront of my mind to make sure I didn't end up, up in that place. And um, so, ask for help first and foremost, and find somebody that can help you, and be okay with that. Because when you're rock bottom, um, the only way is up. Um, the 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 second one is to celebrate your small wins. You know, getting out of bed in the morning is a win. <laughs> is a win sitting up in bed is a win you know celebrate those little steps getting in the shower yeah I got in the shower today I'm not hanging around in my pjs feeling sorry for myself you know celebrate the the little things and those little things will become long journey of of discovery um and if you struggle to acknowledge how far you've got to go acknowledge how far you've come and just take one step forward each day and keep going. And that's what I do from a mountaineering, a ski touring perspective is it, when you do ski touring, it's really hard. And it may feel like you're never going to get to the end of the tour because you've got these huge mountains to overcome and it, and it feels too much. 
break it down into really tiny steps. Just get that foot one step in front of the other and just keep going. And it doesn't matter how slow you go, because as long as you keep going, you'll get there. And, and just do those little tiny steps. Wow. That is, if you, if you take anything out of all of your time listening to this podcast, those are three remarkable suggestions. And, and to back up um, what, what Dr. Ruth Allen is saying, there was actually a study done. I think Dr. Martin Seligman was part of it at the University of Penn, where they mm -hmm. looked at a group of people that were severely depressed. And over 30 days, they simply had that group of people write down three good things. I think the, the study it was actually called it's a gratitude things. study. Yeah, they, they wrote down three good things that happened every day in their lives. So at the end of every day, it was I took a shower, I, I had a conversation with my daughter, I, you know, went for a small walk, they just wrote, they started to look at the good things. And after 30 days, I think there was a, a preponderance of over 90% of those people reported going from severely depressed to moderately or mildly depressed just by focusing on the good things. So yeah, uh, I, I find that to be to be sage in your you know, your, your compassion, empathy, you know, after I did your podcast and, and we, we went really deep into, into my own history, I just, you know, I want to publicly thank you for reaching out to me after, um, you're just, yeah, you're just so, um, so caring and, and it comes across and, you know, so to now sit down and hear, hear your story and have you come on to help our listeners is, is amazing. And so can you maybe just, as we finish, kind of share, how people can get more connected to you and your teachings and, and, and the things that you're doing, because, um, you know, we really do need you. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I'm just absolutely happy to help you, uh, you know, and support you in anything. And you know, that from the I messages do. I sent you and I, uh, um, and thank you for your kind words. So, um, just, you can reach out to me, Ruth, Mary Allen, um, dot com is my website r u t h m a r y a w l a n dot com um, or uh, Ruth Mary Allen on all social media platforms that you can think of. Um, just just reach out to me. You can connect with me for for a, a, a free consultation uh, from my website, and you can also sign up to uh, trauma recovery group coaching. is available every week for people. Um, we have uh, programs to help. Uh, talking about havening my daughter lily's done her own mini program to help educate children with havening so you can sign up for that too if you want to um as well as obviously private coaching with myself and a whole heap of other programs related to brain health that you can get access to well i am a lifelong fan and i am i'm, <laughs> I'm eternally grateful to to the connection and, and thank chris uh chris the great chris lord chris ross for uh for connecting us and all he's doing and and you know, just, I wish you all the best, continued success. And